Today's video is sponsored by Wondrium. If you're a long-time subscriber to any of my channels, you'll know that one of our long-time partners is The Great Courses Plus. While the management team behind The Great Courses Plus are expanding and rebranding their operation to cover an even wider expanse of learning material and educational experiences. The finished product is Wondrium, a really cool online theater where you can access all the great content from the original great courses, plus tons of fresh content spanning, well, every possible subject you could imagine. For example, in previous videos, maybe I've recommended a series of Ivy League lectures about Canadian history or an Oxford profile about colonialism, and well, you can still find all of that stuff. But now there's also loads of tutorials, travel logs, documentaries, and well, a ton else. Each piece of content is rigorously researched and presented by engaging subject matter experts, so you know you're getting some of the best content available anywhere online. In short, if you're a lifelong learner, and you probably are watching this channel, then there's no better place for you than Wondrium. It's like an ornate palace for your brain. I particularly recommend checking out their 48 episode series, A History of England, from the Tudors to the Stuarts. It goes into great detail on and this is a quote, how England transformed itself from a medieval backwater into the first modern state. It's really good detailed stuff if you're into UK history, and honestly, even if you're not, you probably will be after you watch it. Go to wondrium.com forward slash brain food for a free trial, wondrium.com forward slash brain food. There's also a link below. In 1946, Great Britain teetered on the edge of an abyss. Though the nation had emerged victorious from the Second World War, the conflict had left its economy in tatters. Britain's war effort had depended on vast loans of money, food, and other material from the United States, and with little means of relying on these loans post-war, the nation found itself hurtling towards what economist John Maynard Keynes called a financial Dunkirk. So dire was this economic situation that food rationing, first implemented in 1940 to conserve scarce wartime resources, would not be lifted until 1954. While the most obvious solution was to borrow even more money from the United States, such loans came with strings attached, namely Britain's commitment to abandoning its protectionist economic policies in favor of free trade. While Winston Churchill, defeated in the 1945 election, would eventually collaborate with the Labour government of Prime Minister Clement Attlee to secure further American loans, in the meantime, the British government began casting about for an internal solution to the crisis, preferably one that could leverage the major asset that Britain did have, its massive colonial empire. In 1946, one potential solution emerged in the form of an unlikely saviour the humble peanut. What followed became known as the Tanganyika Groundnut Scheme, one of the most infamous boondoggles in British colonial history. The Tanganyika Groundnut Scheme was the brainchild of one Frank Samuel, the managing director of the United Africa Company, or UAC. UAC was a subsidiary of the British corporate giant Unilever, which produced nearly three quarters of all the margarine sold in Western Europe and two thirds of the soap used in the British Empire. While flying over the British East African colony of Tanganyika, today the United Republic of Tanzania, Samuel was struck by the vast swaths of forest and savanna that remained uncleared and uncultivated. Samuel spoke with the colony's director of agricultural production, who suggested that the land could be cleared and used to plant oil seeds like peanuts. To Samuel, such a scheme was the perfect solution to the British government's economic problems. Not only would peanut cultivation on a massive scale boost the British economy and bring much needed jobs and development to a colonial backwater, but it would also help alleviate a growing European food oil shortage, as Samuel later recalled. I wondered whether this wasteland could not grow oil crops to the benefit of the margarine ration of the British housewife and the legitimate profits of the United Africa Company. But there was a problem. As a private company, Unilever would have difficulty obtaining the rationed equipment and supplies required for such a massive undertaking. Samuel thus presented his scheme to the British Ministry of Food as a government-run colonial development scheme. Samuel's pitch was greatly aided by the fact that the head of the Ministry of Food, John Strachey, was a former Marxist who saw the scheme as an ideal opportunity to export centralized socialist economic policies to the rest of the empire. In June 1946, Strachey dispatched an expedition headed by John Wakefield, an agronomist with 18 years of experience in Tanganyika, and he was to evaluate the feasibility of the project. Wakefield had long been concerned by the problem of rural populations outgrowing their food supply and concentrating in dirty, disorganized shantytowns, 
which he saw as the source of countless social ills. He also believed that traditional Tanganyikan agricultural practices were inefficient and damaging to the soil, and that modern agricultural practices could significantly increase the productivity of the land. Nothing but the most highly mechanized methods on a vast scale never previously envisaged will result in any appreciable amelioration of the presently disastrous food situation. Wakefield and his team completed their investigation in only three months, submitting their final report to the Ministry of Food in September of 1946. The way Wakefield report listed the southern province of Tanganyika as being best suited to peanut cultivation, with Kongwa and the central province as a close second. These areas were selected not only for the fertility of the soil, but due to their being largely uninhabited and unused by the locals, allowing the problems of population displacement and compensation to be avoided. Based on these and Samuel's original recommendations, the Ministry of Food set up the Public Overseas Food Corporation to manage the scheme, headed by Major General Desmond Harrison. The Tanganyika ground nut scheme was extraordinarily ambitious, calling for nearly 3.5 million acres of forest and brush to be cleared over six years, an area the size of the U.S. state of Connecticut. The venture was projected to produce up to 800,000 tons of peanuts every year and recover its initial costs within two to three years, all for an initial investment of only £24,000. Furthermore, the project was expected to create over 32,000 jobs for local African workers, as well as key infrastructure such as railways and a deep water port that would help boost the local economy. The scheme was officially approved in January 1947, and by February, the first ships bearing equipment, supplies, and European experts began arriving at the Tanganyikan port of Dar es Salaam. However, it immediately became clear that the planners in London had vastly underestimated the enormity of the task at hand, for the Tanganyikan landscape consisted not merely of regular forest and brush, but what legendary British explorer Henry Morton Stanley referred to as an interim jungle of thorn bushes, mile after mile of damn all. And as former Labour politician Alan Wood wrote in his 1950 book, The Ground Nut Affair, in patches, the thickest of scrub are impenetrable, a rhinoceros can force a way through, a snake can wiggle through, but no size or shape of animal in between, except a bulldozer. Unfortunately, even bulldozers proved no match for the Tanganyikan brush, which caused most of the machines to break down within days. With proper earth-moving equipment in short supply in post-war Europe, the scheme instead imported large numbers of surplus American Sherman tanks, which were converted by the Vickers Engineering Company into improvised bulldozers nicknamed Sherviks. But even these proved ill-suited to the task. The Tanganyikan soil was an impenetrable mass of thick, rubbery tree roots that resisted even the most powerful machines, while many sites were overgrown with giant baobab trees, which proved almost impossible to knock over. Even worse, many of these trees hosted large hives of dangerous African bees whose stings landed hundreds of workers in the hospital. Other natural hazards included venomous snakes and insects carrying tropical diseases like malaria and sleeping sickness. However, through trial and error, the workers managed to find ways of making some headway. One particularly effective brush clearing method was to sling a heavy chain between two bulldozers, with a third bulldozer following behind to knock down any trees which resisted this initial assault. Using this method, three bulldozers could clear 40 acres a day, as opposed to only 15 working alone. But when the workers put in an order for more ships anchor chain, a bureaucrat in London dismissed it as a practical joke and ignored the request, leading to further delays. However, even with such methods, the results fell far short of expectations. By the project's second year, only 50,000 acres had been cleared, less than 2% of original projections. And of this 50,000, less than 13,000 acres were properly cleared and plowed. But the problems didn't end there. While the Wakefield report had confirmed the fertility of the soil, it had failed to mention that its high clay content made it set hard as concrete during the dry season, leading one worker to state, nothing short of pneumatic drills and dynamite could get the nuts out. Indeed, so hard was the soil that it wore out regular agricultural plows within five hours. The choice of Congwa district also proved to be a fatal error. While the Wakefield report had recommended cultivating the southern Tanganyika district, project administrators discovered that not only was this area covered in difficult-to-clear trees, but had no rail connections to major ports like Dar es Salaam. Thus, in these respects, Congwa was the superior choice, if not for one minor factor, the climate. 
Known to the locals as the country of perpetual drought, Kongwa received very little rainfall compared to more southern districts. In fact, throughout the entire four-year duration of the groundnut scheme, only once was there sufficient annual rainfall to sustain a peanut crop. It was later revealed that Wakefield had based his recommendations on the fact that the local Tanganyikans cultivated peanut crops in the area, even though these plots were rarely ever larger than an acre and only cultivated during the wet season. This willful ignorance of local conditions and knowledge was but one of the many factors that would eventually conspire to sink the entire groundnut scheme. Yet, despite the dire situation on the ground, the bureaucrats in London continued to make wildly optimistic forecasts, which the planners could not possibly hope to meet. Though by November 1947, the projected cultivation had dropped from 150,000 acres to only 60,000, the workers only managed to plant 42,000 acres, 32,000 of which were either not fully leveled and plowed or planted on a dry lake bed, which required little clearance. This resulted in only 2,000 tons of peanuts being harvested in 1948, less than half of what had originally been purchased as seed. But as Alan Wood later recalls, the planners remained blissfully optimistic, simply shifting the 150,000 acre goal to the second year of the project. I knew that I could not, for the life of me, see how 150,000 acres were to be cleared in 1948, but it was only after four months that I realized those running the scheme had not the remotest notion either. At the time I was in East Africa, I was told confidently that between 125,000 and 145,000 would be achieved. I did not say much, assuming that, as a newcomer, people were not yet ready to take me into their confidence on the state of affairs. It was only later that the horrible truth dawned on me. My informants were not trying to deceive me. They had simply deceived themselves. Meanwhile, the cost of the project ballooned into the tens of millions of pounds, and problems on the grounds continued to pile up. The scheme's reliance on the single railway connecting Kongwa to Dar es Salaam caused the port to become hopelessly congested, leading to endless supply and communication problems. These logistical issues were epitomized by one early work team who discovered that their first breakfast consisted of ham and 40 eggs piled onto a single plate to be eaten with only one knife, fork, and spoon. Even the one arguably successful outcome of the scheme came at a cost. As intended, the groundnut scheme resulted in the employment of some 30,000 Africans at high wages, allowing the local economy to flourish. However, in certain communities like those of the Gogo people, the lure of well-paid wage labor led many men to abandon their family farms, reducing agricultural output and contributing to severe famines in 1947, 1949, and 1950. Workers also gathered in large settlements that became infamous hives of gambling, alcoholism, and prostitution, much to the dismay of colonial social reformers. Corruption was also common at all levels of the workforce. For example, supervisors would often find tractors concealed in ditches, abandoned but still running. This was because operators were paid according to the number of hours their tractors were running, as measured by a clock attached to the engine. Many operators would thus conceal their tractors in ditches, leave them running, and then go drinking for several hours before returning. By 1949, it had become abundantly clear that the groundnut scheme was in serious trouble. And despite John Strachey's attempts to put a lid on the fiasco until the 1950 general election, in the summer of 1950, the Overseas Food Corporation appointed a working party to evaluate the long-term viability of the project. In September, the party reported that the peanut crops were costing six times what they were worth to produce, concluding the project for large-scale mechanized production of groundnuts should be abandoned. The original aims of the scheme have proved incapable of fulfillment. Mechanical clearing can be done, but it cannot be done at an economic cost. But the new Minister of Food, Maurice Webb, refused to back down, and a last-ditch effort was made to save the scheme by planting sunflowers. Unlike peanuts, sunflowers did not require as much labor-intensive clearing and plowing of the land, and the seeds could be harvested above ground. But even this scheme fell prey to the arid climate of Kongwa, and when the rains inevitably failed, so did the sunflower crop, and so did the entire Tanganyika venture along with it. The groundnut scheme was officially abandoned on January 9, 1951, after four years of operation, the whole project cost a whopping £36 million, the equivalent of a billion pounds today, for which the British taxpayer received not so much as a minor increase in their margarine ration. The spectacular failure of the Tanganyikan groundnut scheme, described at the time as the worst fiasco in recent British colonial history, and Britain's oleaginous Iliad, was a major political scandal for the Antley government. For years afterward, the Conservative Party used the disaster as a ready example of the dangers of socialist central planning, 
leading one Labour politician to bemoan, Those aging young conservatives who went from meeting to meeting shouting ground nuts every time any Labour candidate tried to emphasize the electorate, the need for expanding the development of the underdeveloped areas. In the wake of the fiasco, politicians scrambled to find an explanation for the disaster. Some, including socialists like Alan Wood, wondered whether the problem lay in the decision to run the scheme as a public development initiative rather than as a private for-profit enterprise, reasoning that the profit motive might have incentivized project managers to be more creative and efficient. However, he ultimately concluded that the main flaw of the scheme was its over-centralization, which prevented timely and flexible decision-making on the ground and burdened individual managers with excessive workloads. They worked too hard. They were themselves into such a state of weariness, fever, and fret that they could not think ahead. Too much has been written about the benefits of capitalism in providing the driving force of the profit motive. What is more difficult to replace is the function of the price mechanism in dividing up decisions among a large number of different people. The trouble is not that General Harrison was a stupid man or an incompetent man. He was plainly a man of great ability. The trouble was he carried a heavier burden than any man could bear. Others criticized John Strachey's concept of the scheme as a military-style operation, pointing out that while in military operations cost is unimportant, in agricultural projects even the most minor costs must be carefully managed. But the ultimate cause was the fact that the entire scheme itself was fundamentally flawed and hastily executed. The very premise of the ground nut scheme was predicated on a racist colonial view that Africans were lazy and unsophisticated, and that the only reason that vast tracts of Tanganyika wilderness had not already been cultivated was that the locals lacked the will, knowledge, and technology to do so. On the contrary, the locals, who had been living on the land for centuries, were well aware of what the landscape was capable of producing, and had developed various traditional farming methods, including crop rotation, mixed culture, and mixed cropping and ranching, in order to obtain the great possible yields. Indeed, following the end of the scheme, local Tanganyikans managed to successfully use the land cleared for peanut cultivation to ranch cattle. Even the vast tracts of wilderness that British sought to conquer were, ironically, largely created by the colonialists themselves as the depopulation of the countryside, wrought by imported diseases like influenza, resulted in large areas of formerly agricultural land becoming overgrown. These local realities were either completely overlooked or willingly ignored by the groundnut scheme's planners, who embarked on the ambitious venture without even running a pilot project to determine whether it would even work. Indeed, many of the scheme's backers insisted that a project of this scale was so unprecedented that a pilot project would yield no relevant information. Most baffling of all, the scheme ignored the realities of the very system that they were trying to impose upon Tanganyika, American-style peanut cultivation. In contrast to the vast mechanically cultivated fields envisioned by the groundnut scheme, most American peanut fields of the era were no larger than a few acres and largely cultivated using horses and mules. Furthermore, large monoculture crops are highly susceptible to diseases like reset virus, which became so prevalent in certain parts of Tanganyika that peanut cultivation was banned in these areas from 1953 onwards. The half-baked and delusional nature of the whole scheme is perhaps best summed up by Alan Wood, who wrote in 1950, I imagined my former colleagues sitting by their far sides in a reminiscent mood, wondering if it really happened, or whether they merely dreamt in some idle moments that the timber mill was sighted before anyone had really counted the trees for the wood, that a pipeline costing £500,000 or more was built to take fuel and a huge expense to tanks set miles from anywhere in the African bush, that a railway was begun without anyone knowing exactly where it was going to in the end, and that inspiring everyone was a faith that you could grow groundnuts when you had not even bothered to inspect the ground. The Tanganyikan groundnut scheme was not the first nor the last large-scale agricultural project to make such mistakes. In 1928, American industrialist Henry Ford attempted to create a vast 10,000 square kilometer plantation called Fordlandia in the Amazon rainforest in order to supply rubber for automobile tires. However, Ford's insistence on planting the rubber trees close together in straight lines against the advice of local rubber tappers resulted in most of the plants being lost to tree blight. Ford's attempts to impose strict protest and moral values on the local workers also backfired, resulting in the plantation being abandoned in 1934. More recently, in the 1970s, American entrepreneur Daniel K. Ludwig launched a similar endeavor called the Jari Project, an attempt to create a tree plantation and pulp and paper mill on the Rio Jari in the Brazilian Amazon. Like Fordlandia, however, the Jari Project quickly fell prey to the realities of the local environment, including the unsuitably slow growth of the pulp trees, tropical diseases, and the difficulties in maintaining a reliable labor force. After only three years, Ludwig abandoned the project and sold his land to a consortium of Brazilian businessmen. All these failed schemes dramatically 
illustrate the dangers of ignoring local knowledge and customs and are in their own way microcosms of the folly and tragedy of colonialism itself. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.